part two. And um, before we go into this part two, I just want to remind us the goal of this series and uh, what we talked about last time. So the goal here is to bring us to an elevated understanding of the God we serve so that we can serve Him better. Amen? Amen. Amen. And while we work towards this, this goal, I understand that we're going to enjoy this sermon. Amen. But that is not the only thing that I want out of this. I want this, uh, this sermon to challenge us, to challenge our thinking, the way we understand God and the way that we serve Him. So that we can be more fruitful in our pursuit to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So last week, the title, uh, sorry, not last week, but last time, the title of the sermon was God Revealed, which was part one. And I'm just going to go over some points that we talked about, three main points that we talked about, to just refresh your mind since it's been a while. Amen? Amen. So point number one was like, was uh, unlike starting a relationship with a person, the initiative lies entirely on God, not to you. When you're starting a relationship with God, the initiative lies entirely on God, not on you. And we looked at John chapter four, verse, uh, John chapter six, verse forty-four, on that point. And then the other point was God shows Himself to some people much more to other, than other people, and that is not because He is favorites. We discussed, but it is because some, it is impossible for Him to reveal Himself to someone whose entire character and mind is pointed in the wrong direction. Amen? Amen? And we talked about how the mirrors of our hearts must be pure, must be clean of the grime and the dirt, so that God can clearly reveal himself and his image can be clearly shown within our hearts. Amen? Amen. And then we, we are, the, the third point was God can only reveal himself as it really is to people with real goodness. And at the end of the sermon, we're talking about what this real goodness looks like and how God wants it not only in our lives, but also in the church, as a body of believers, he wants this real goodness. And this week, today, if you can go on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Again. Okay, so this week, we'll, talk about, we'll take this, this concept of real goodness and expand it into something that I hope you will find more challenging. But we're going to take it and turn it into perfection. So the title for this chapter 2 is Charge to Perfection. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is coming from Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. If somebody can read that. This is the focal scripture right here, what this whole thing is coming from. So we talked about how God wants us to have real goodness, real efforts towards removing sin, removing darkness from our hearts. But now we want to change that into perfection. Amen? Amen. Go on. Verse 48. Verse 48. Yes. Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye therefore perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Thank you. Yes. Jesus just commanded us to be perfect. He wants us to be perfect. And he means it. And he means it just as much just as much as he meant what he, what he said when he said he will lay down his life for our sinful selves. He meant it then and he means this now. He wants us to be perfect. And you know what? Uh, when I came, when the idea of this sermon came to me, I was in the car reading uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And he was talking about being perfect, this very subject. It was uh, so difficult for me to understand. It was hard for me to grasp that. How can God want us to be perfect? How can Jesus command us to be perfect? And he was explaining what that means. And as, uh, as I read, I, I just wanted to stop because it wasn't really processing in my mind. But the more I read, the more I looked into it, the more it began to, uh, to make sense to me as I sought to understand. Amen? Amen? That God wants us to be perfect. That Jesus commanded us to be perfect. And yes, this is a commandment, not a suggestion. He's not suggesting that be perfect if you can, but he's commanding us to be perfect. Amen? Amen? And if God is commanding us to be perfect, you can be sure. If he's commanding us to, be, to do something, you can be sure that he has the sense to know that it is possible. So if he's asking us to be perfect, that means somewhere, somehow, it is possible for us to be perfect. We just have to figure out how. But since he has commanded it, it must be perfect. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, for us to understand this, let us uh, look at the context when he, when he gave this commandment. He gave this uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. 
And this is a very long sermon that Jesus gave. It spans from uh, Matthew chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7. Jesus preaching about various things. And um, one of the most important things that he did, he revisited the law and he clarified some misconceptions, some misunderstandings that people had about the law. Amen? Amen. He looked at murder. He said, you have heard he was saved. You shall not murder. But I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is guilty of the same judgment. Amen? Amen? And on adultery, he said, you have heard, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you, whoever looks at a woman with lust commits adultery with her in his heart. On us, he said, uh, he said you have heard that thou shalt surely fulfill every oath that you make to the Lord, but I tell you, let your yes be a yes, and your no be a no. And then, on an eye for an eye, he said, you have heard that you are saved, take an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, turn the other cheek. So he touched on adultery, he touched on divorce, he touched on lying, he touched on revenge. And all these things, if you look at them, they're things that take the heart of men and turn it into devils. It makes devils out of men. Therefore, he wants us to not be so given to these things, but instead to be like our Father, who is perfect. Amen? Because perfection is the only thing that is entirely impossible for the devil. The devil cannot be like God. Therefore, for us to be completely removed from the devil, he wants us to be like God. Amen? Amen. So let us go and look, deep, look deeper into this to see what he really meant about this. You see, the thing about Jesus, as C.S. Lewis puts it, the Son of God became man to enable men to be sons of God. And just as Jesus, the Son of God, is perfect, he wants to enable us also to be perfect. But the beautiful truth in all of this is that we can never be perfect in our human nature. It is impossible for us in our humanity, in our humanness, to be perfect. That is both a difficult thing to understand because all our lives we've been raised to understand that no one is perfect and no one can be perfect. Perfection is an attribute of God and God alone. And no one can achieve it. And yes, that is partially true because if you try and seek perfection in your human nature, you will surely fail. There's a different way to achieve perfection, and that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If we are to be perfect, we must move from our human nature and be transformed into something else. Go on, please. If you may not, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Yes. For out of light affliction... 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, seven. therefore, if any man be in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. All things are passed away. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He has been renewed. If you are in Christ, you have been made new. You have been made into a new creature. You have been transformed. And this creature should be as different as how a caterpillar is different from a butterfly. We all know that caterpillars turn into butterflies, but looking at a caterpillar, you can never guess that he wanted to end up being a butterfly, correct? Mm -hmm. That is what he wants from us. He wants us to be entirely transformed, because unless we are transformed in him, we can never achieve perfection. We must first be transformed in order to be perfect. You see, most people go to Christ when they have one problem that is so big for them that they cannot figure it out. So they come to God to, for him to help him. Because they have a difficulty, they realize a brokenness in one specific area of their life. So they find themselves before the Savior, so that he can solve this one issue that they had. And being God, he's all the more happy to heal them of that problem, to deliver them from that problem, but he's not going to stop there. You work on everything, you keep on fixing everything, until you are perfect. You come with one problem, but he wants to work on you, until he solves all the problems. You see, it's very much like going to, to the car dealer. We don't really do that a lot because you know that when you take your car to the dealer with the problem, they want to fix the problem part all right, but they want to scan it through their computers and I tell you the whole list of everything that is wrong with your car. And how much you got to pay them for them to fix it. They will fix your problem, but they want to fix everything else until your car is in perfect shape. And they do this because they're driven for the, by the desire of your mind. But when you come to God with one problem, you fix that problem, and he wants to work on everything else. 
You keep on working on you until you are perfect. Until he's able to say, this is my child with whom I am well pleased with. And what drives him is not the desire for your money or the desire for anything that you have to offer him. But purely out of his love. Because he wants to see you become perfect as he is. He wants to transform you to become an image of himself. He created you to be an image of himself. But sin has so tainted that image and make us look more like devils. But he wants to restore us. And he will not stop until we do this. You see, the kind of perfection that he's asking for here is not the perfection in ability. It's not in memory. It's not in speech. It's not in health. It's not in school. It's not in work. Because face to face, not every one of us can perform, can perform perfectly in those areas. That is not what he's looking for. The perfection that he wants is the perfection at heart. And when he said this, he was not speaking on the same level with the, with the person who says everyone is beautiful at heart. Because that person who says that is saying that to make you feel good. But Jesus was saying this to challenge you. To challenge your thinking. To challenge your understanding. To challenge everything about you. To revolt you. And make you seek towards something even greater. Not to make you feel good. Not to butter up your feelings. But he wants to challenge you. Amen? Amen. And those who sell, those who surrender themselves to him, those who put themselves in his hands, will become perfect just as he is. They will become perfect in love, perfect in wisdom, perfect in joy, perfect in peace, and perfect morally. Can somebody please open Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 to 10? Yes. Verse 9 to 10. 9 to 10. Yes. The heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. This is God's assessment of the human heart. Go on. And desperately wicked. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? 10. Yes. I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. God himself has searched the heart of every person. Go on. I try the rain. I tried the reins. Even to give every man according to his ways. Christian ushers them. God has searched the heart. And he has found that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Always seeking new ways to sin against him. New ways to turn away from him. New ways to become devils. Even more evil devils. That is how the heart is. God, he understands that. He understands how desperately wicked we are. But regardless of all of that, he is pleased with every little effort that we make towards perfection. But I tell you what, he is not satisfied until we are made perfect. You see, every parent is pleased when their child says their first word, when he says dada. But what parent is satisfied if all that child ever does is say dada? No parent will be satisfied with that. But a parent whose mind is in the right place will be well satisfied when that child has become a full-grown man or a full-grown woman who not only speaks fluently, but is in charge of his own house, or her own house, provides for that house. And that is something far greater from simply saying, Dada. That is what God wants from us. Every little effort, no matter how small it is, that we make towards greatness, that we make towards perfection, he is very pleased with it. Can somebody open Luke chapter 15, verse 10, please? Verse 10. 10. Fix the answer's name. Amen. And likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God. Over one sinner that repented. Over one sinner that repents. The angels rejoice. They hold a feast. They, glor they glorify the Lord. Over one person confessing the name of the Lord. Over one person turning. And proclaiming his greatness. And those are the first words of your spiritual self. And the angels rejoice over that. And God is very pleased with that. But he's not going to, to be satisfied until that same soul that has turned to him, that has repented him, he has been made perfect. That is the only time he will be satisfed. You see, Matthew chapter, nine, chapter 7 verse 19 says, 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Amen? Amen. You see, spiritual growth is very important. But that is not so much what God is after. He wants us to grow spiritually. But that is not what he really wants from us. What he wants from these people is produce. This church is filled with a lot of people that are spiritually grown. But what God is very concerned with is the produce that we make in his name. You see, a tree can be fully grown, but if that fully grown, mature tree does not bear fruit, he still cuts it down. Amen. So no matter how grown you are spiritually, if you're not producing fruit in his name, if you're not doing good in his name, he still cuts it down. But the day that tree was planted, he was very pleased. And he's only satisfied when that tree is producing a lot of fruit. You see, an orchard is not judged by the number of trees in it, or by the size of trees in the orchard. It is judged by the amount of fruit it produces. That's how you know a good orchard, by, the, by how much fruit it is producing. The more fruit that orchard has, the more perfect that orchard is. Amen? Amen. You see, an artist once said, Making a perfect statue is nothing more than removing unwanted pieces and highlighting the ones you want. We have seen a lot of great statues of people of the past, George Washington, statues of Caesar, a lot of Roman emperors, there have been statues of angels, of Jesus himself, and they're perfect statues, they're very beautiful. But an artist who was very skilled in this, he said, that is nothing more than removing the pieces you don't want and highlighting the ones you want. Same reasoning, perfection is nothing more than removing the unwanted qualities within us and highlighting the good qualities within us. Therefore, God, when he demanded us to be perfect, he wants us to remove sin from our hearts, to remove the evil from our hearts, and highlight the fruits of the Spirit, and highlight the, the things that more closely represent who he is. That's what he wants. And last week we talked about how we have to remove grim and dust from the mirrors of our hearts. Amen? Amen. And uh, we, read on, we read from Colossians chapter 3 and identified what this grim and, and, and dust is. Uh, chapter 5 of uh, Colossians 3, sorry, verse 5, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immolarity, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. You see, God is very pleased with real efforts to do these things. He is pleased when we put real goodness, real efforts into removing anger, removing rage, removing malice, removing sexual immorality. But he's not going to be satisfied until we put in perfect efforts towards that. Amen. That is why we're satisfying. Therefore, in our charge to perfection, as we remove these unwanted qualities, let us highlight the godly qualities. If you can open with me to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. A lot of this is coming from the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. He's in the Ashford's name. Amen. Amen. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long suffering. Is that it? Yes, that is it. And uh, the new king, that is the uh, King James Version. The new King James, uh, the new King James Version says, "Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and delight, and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you." And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And I want to go over the virtues that Paul pointed out here. You see, God was demanding us to put perfect efforts into having these virtues, removing the bad ones and highlighting these godly virtues. Amen? Amen. And he gave us perfect examples of how to do all of this. And the best example, the most perfect example he gave us is the one on the cross. You see, he will not be satisfied with real goodness or real effort towards it, but he will only be satisfied with perfect effort towards this. Only perfect compassion will satisfy him. And that is the same compassion 
that drove him to the cross. And only perfect humility was satisfied, which is the same humility that made him to bear through all the torture he endured. And then you only be satisfied with perfect gentleness, the same gentleness that made him remain quiet like a lamb. And you'll be satisfied with perfect forgiveness, the same one that made him pray for mercy over the very people that were crucifying him. And you'll be, you'll be satisfied with perfect patience, the same one that made him wait so that you could say, it is finished. And you only be satisfied with perfect love, the very same love that put the idea of self-sacrifice in his mind. That is what he wants from us. All of these things, they're part of knowing God and serving him better. So let us keep these things close to our hearts as we serve him. Let us keep them very close to our hearts and on the forefront of our minds in our charge to perfection. And this brings us to an end of part two. Next time, we'll be going on to part three in the title for that one is Perfect Love. We're ending on the note of love, of that love that drove him to the cross, that love that put the very idea in his mind. Next, next time, 